Thank you for coming by for my Monday message. It's Monday, January the 8th, 2024. And uh, we're going to take a little uh, a look at a passage from Mark 10, 13 through 16. I call this Jesus Blesses Children. Big deal. Jesus wants to bless children. He values children. We're going to look at that today. And I um, hope you subscribe to my channel. Hit the bell so you get notified every time I put something out. I do stuff every day, uh, lots of things. That if you have a prayer need, put it in the prayer, put it in the comments, and I'll put out a prayer video and get hundreds of people praying for you. And, uh, and ask God to use my channel to make a difference in people's lives. Let's take a minute and pray, and we're going to jump into this message, Mark 10. We're working our way through the Gospel of Mark on Mondays, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John on Fridays. Do a Bible study, different things in the middle of the week. Every day I'll put out five, six shorts and prayer videos and do my daily devotions. I put out stuff every day and try to keep you in the word and I'll put out prayer, create prayer ministry for you. Christian Ministry Central is about creating ministry in the name of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for speaking to us, for making yourself clear. I pray that you'd impact our lives by the truth that you have in, in uh, Mark 10, 13 through 16 today. And change us from the inside out. Make us into your people your way. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In Mark 10, 1 through 12, Jesus was asked a question uh, about divorce by a Pharisee. Okay? Pharisee lawyer. Okay? Their question was this. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus shot a question right back at the Pharisees. Answered their question with a question. What did Moses command you, said Jesus? The Pharisees answered with what Moses permitted, not what Moses commanded, which was that a man was permitted to write a certificate of divorce for his wife. He could, you know, decide to change wives and write her a certificate of divorce if she displeased him in any way. And then Jesus proceeded to tell them what Moses commanded, which was his question, explaining that God made them male and female, and for that reason, a man was to leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The old King James word was cleave. It meant me to put to be put put together so completely and so totally that to take you apart would damage both parts. They were to be one flesh. They were to be one. One man, one woman put together for one life. That was his answer. Okay. So when asked about divorce. Jesus answered by taking the Pharisees to marriage as the answer. I call it one plus one equals one, okay? That man and his wife make the basis for a family. Now, in natural progression, Jesus moves in verses 13 through 16 of Mark chapter 10 to children, okay? The husband and wife get together together. And what do they do? They produce a family. They have children. And he moves to considering children in verses 13 through 16. In fact, verse 13 in the original Greek has a conjunction that's not translated in the New International Version. It, it, would, it would be like this. And, that's the conjunction, the people were bringing little children to Jesus. Verse 12 is connected to verse 13 with the conjunction making a natural transition to the thought of children, putting the finishing touch on the family. Children put the finishing touch on the family. Let's look at, verse, at Mark 10, 13 through 16. Mark 10, 13 through 16. And, uh, and you know what? I'm going to read verse 12 with it to kind of put it together. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. And the people were bringing their little children to Jesus to have him touch them. He moved right into discussion about children after talking about marriage. Uh, but the disciples rebuked them. Verse 14, when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms and put his hands on them and blessed them. Wow, great passage. 
Notice that Jesus would not tolerate downplaying children. Wouldn't tolerate downplaying children. People were bringing children to Jesus for him to touch them, for him to bless them. What did the disciples do? They rebuked the people. They're treating it like, oh, this big shot doesn't have time to be bothered with a bunch of kids. Jesus makes it clear that that kind of thought is nonsense, okay? So how did Jesus respond in verse 14? It says that Jesus was indignant. Why did Jesus respond like that? He tells them why. Because the kingdom of God belongs to folks like little children. Children, he wants them involved in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God belongs to folks like little children. It is easy to downplay children. You know, as a child myself, it's been a long time since I was a child. I'm 75 years old. But I remember adults saying, my mom and dad and grandparents saying, children should be seen, not heard, okay? Jesus wanted the children hanging around him. Why? Because they mattered. He wanted them seen and heard. They count to Jesus. They should count to us. Mark 10, 13, the word for child is used. It's the Greek word peda, P-A-I-D-A is the transliteration of it. It usually refers to a child under the age of 12 or so, a child. In a parallel passage in Luke 18, 15, the word for baby, infant, is used. It's the word brefe. And why are the words important? Well, the, the words always are important. In communication, words matter. It's because Jesus wants babies, infants, and children to come to him. He does not downplay babies or children. They are important to him, desperately important to him. Uh, I was in a church service in Phoenix, Arizona, one Sunday in the early 1970s, and the governor of the state came into the service with his security squad and his staff. They knew he was coming. And in a row in the auditorium was roped off for all of them, you know. And and he came in with his security force and all that kind of stuff. He has to have that. That's obvious. And they were seen as important. Let me tell you how Jesus sees children. Jesus sees children the same way that church saw the governor. They're important to him. They matter to him. Jesus would not tolerate downplaying children then and he won't tolerate it now. He wants children uplifted, cared for. Notice that the kingdom of God belongs to such as children. In fact, Jesus went so far as to say that if you won't accept, accept the kingdom of God like a child will, you'll never enter it, you know? So here, here, here's how to see that, okay? If you won't accept the rule of Jesus like a child will, you won't get in, okay? The kingdom of God is the rule of Jesus. It's volunteered for. It's not imposed. You volunteer for it. You choose to put yourself under Jesus' rule. We need to be willing to volunteer for the rule of Jesus like a child would, which means we believe him and we trust him. We spent, uh, my wife and I spent 12 years pastoring a church in Lemon Grove, California. We had a preschool and, uh, and a daycare ministry there. We served 100, up to 120 babies and children through kindergarten in, in, in that ministry, taking care of them while their parents worked and stuff. As a part of playtime, you get a group of toddlers to dance around like wild people with reckless abandon. Try that when they're 12 or 13. They're not going to do that. You know why? They don't trust people anymore. They don't want to sell out to people anymore like they will when they're little toddlers. They, they have no, they, they don't hold back. They trust you. Little children are not self-conscious and they'll do almost anything when someone they trust is influencing them. And that is something that we dare not uh, misuse. And it gets misused all the time. Jesus cares about children. Jesus wants children blessed. Now, before we're done with this passage, he's gonna take them in his arm and bless them. Take them in his arms and bless the children. From time to time, you'll see in the news stories about someone alone with children abusing them sexually. It happens in churches, unfortunately. By nature, they are not self-conscious, making them vulnerable to someone 
who would want to take advantage of them. And that's rampant in our society in different places. It is rampant on our borders right now. More children being raped on our borders probably than any place in the world. Child sex trafficking because the border is open. And it's evil. It's not a misunderstanding. It is abject evil, okay? In our perverse culture today, we need to make sure that children are only with people that can be trusted. Churches should never allow children to be alone with just one adult in the children's church programming or Sunday school programming. should always be two adults and they should be vetted. You should know that they're, that they're not perverse in any way and that have no record of that. And the classrooms and places should be open so other people and parents can come in and check on people. It should be obvious. We should make sure, ensure that children are cared for. See, children are receptive. They believe what you teach them. Jesus would want them to be taught about the kingdom of God or the things of God, the Bible, and that God loves them and that they can trust him. I was taught those things as a child and believed them. Then wandered as a teen and a young man, and a young man wandered far, far away. But guess what happened? I came back to them strong in my 20s because I was taught them as a young person. We want to make sure that children are taught those things. They may wander in their teen years and young adult years, but they'll come back if they're taught those things. Why? Because they trust. They trust, and it stays with them. Kids can get confused by changes going on in their lives and in their bodies as they grow, especially when they hit the preteen years, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. Hormones can rage in preteens and early teens and cause all kinds of confusion. Loving parents who take time with kids can teach, communicate, love them through those tough times of change. They're receptive, they're teachable, but they, we dare not teach them the wrong things and abuse them or take advantage of them. There's some school systems today that want to teach gender selection to kids, listen to this, between the ages of five and eight. That is abject evil, folks. It's not, a, it's not confusion, not sweet people trying to do the right thing. It's abject evil. Remember that they are receptive. They can be influenced by people they look up to. They look up to teachers, and they, and they should. But teachers need to treat those children with godly respect, godly respect. If they are taught that they could be a girl caught in a boy's body or a boy caught in a girl's body, or that they can move back and forth between feeling like a boy and a girl regardless of their gender, regardless of their genetics, regardless of their, of their what, how they were created by God, they can be influenced to go in a direction that will utterly wreck and destroy their life. And it's not confusing, it's evil. It's not, they're, it's not the people who are influencing them are not confused, they're imposing evil on them. Schools have no business teaching this kind of thing at any age. <clears throat> I heard an interview of a young lady who was 23 years old, and she felt confused about her body and her gender at, at a young age, you know, at like 11, 12 years old. And she, she was taught that she was really a boy caught in a girl's body. And she went back and forth on those issues, always confused, by the influence coming from teachers in her school. And so she transitioned to be a boy with drugs, which destroyed a lot of things in her body, okay? At the age of 20, she figured out that she was a girl, wanted to be married, wanted to be a mother, all those things, but she had been influenced in the wrong direction and started to transition back to being a girl. But you know what? It was too late. She, she would never be able to have children. She was destroyed physically and could, could not, you know, conceive and be a mother like she wanted to be. She knows now that she had been abused by the teaching she received at school. She was taken advantage of, damaged, hurt. Many people never recover from that, from that deception. And she will physically never recover from it. And she, will, she won't recover emotionally. That's wrong. That's evil. Schools should not be teaching any kind of this vile deception. 
If you have school age children, you should know that the schools are teach what the schools are teaching and make sure that your children are not being deceived with this gender selection stuff. It's it's craziness. So I mean, make sure that gender studies is not being taught in the schools. You know why? It's child abuse. It's child abuse. Children are content to be dependent, you know. They depend on parents and grandparents. Make sure that parents and grandparents are the main people they depend on and are the main teachers of things like sexuality and all those kinds of things. Mark 10, verse 16, Jesus took the children in his arms and he blessed them. Jesus wants to bless children, especially with his kingdom, okay? He wants children to be willingly under the rule of Jesus as Lord and under the blessings of his kingdom, which are heaven and eternal life with God now and the influence of God in their lives and the power to get through tough times now. He wants them to have that opportunity to live that way. If they choose, they have to choose. They're not, it's not imposed on them. It's voluntary select, cho choice to live under the rule of Jesus. Luke chapter 1 Mary had been visited by the angel and knew that she was pregnant with the Messiah. Imagine that at probably 13 years old or so, maybe 14. Uh, she, she went to visit her relative, a woman named Elizabeth. Elizabeth was very old and she was pregnant with her first child, who would be John the Baptist. So Mary was young and pregnant with Jesus, the Messiah. Elizabeth was old and pregnant with John the Baptist, who would pave the way for Jesus as the Messiah. Mary was newly pregnant while Elizabeth was farther along in her pregnancy, probably about six months. In Luke 141, Mary greets Elizabeth and she hears her greeting. And the scripture says the baby, that the, the infant leaped in her, brefe is the word, leaped in her womb. Elizabeth uses the same word of the baby leaping in her, her womb again in verse 40, 44. The word translated baby is the same word translated baby outside the womb in many other places in the New Testament. It's a baby in the womb and out of the womb. Biblically, if you abort a fetus, you kill a baby. We call this woman's health care in this country today. If you kill a child, it becomes the exact opposite of Jesus taking a child in his hands and blessing them. We've done that over 62 million times since 1973. I, I, I suspect that God is not pleased with that program. What do you think? Now, Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, uh, sending the, uh, the legalities of abortion back to the states by the Constitution. Didn't outlaw abortion. He sent the legalities of it back to the states because that's what the Constitution calls for. This will not rid the country of abortion. It just sends the legality of it back to the states. California, I live in California. I live in Porterville, California. California has made it clear that if when that happens, when states don't allow people to have the abortions, they plan to pass laws to make California the, and proudly so to make California the abortion capital of America and pay for it. With, government, with state funds. Wrong a thousand times over. Wrong. Jesus wants those kids to be born, to be nurtured in the things of God, and to volunteer for the kingdom of God as adults, if they choose. He wants them to have that opportunity. Jesus wants to bless the children with his kingdom. Our mission must be to protect them. Protect them with godly families, so Jesus can bring on his blessings to those people. He wants them to live. Back in the late 1980s, a helicopter landed in the road outside our home in Lemon Grove, California, where I was pastoring a church. And I wondered what was going on. I learned. Uh, the next day, I got a call from a lady in our church. She asked me if I would help with the funeral of a seven-week-old baby girl who's single mom. Uh, lived next door to me. Uh, the baby died from sudden infant death syndrome. And that's what the helicopter was about. I took care of the funeral and tried to minister to that to that young mother. One of the most difficult funerals I've ever done. I've done hundreds of funerals and they've been tough. And I do them all the time now. I've had some tough ones this year, last year. 
But I took care of that funeral and it was difficult. I put doing a funeral service for that little seven week old baby. And listen, this is what I made clear in that service, that Jesus took care of the baby who was not old enough to be responsible for sin. And the baby was in his kingdom and in his care right now, still is. Jesus will take care of children in that kind of situation. But he has delegated to us the job of taking care of children now and protecting them so that they can come to Jesus, so they can hear the good news and receive the blessing of his kingdom in their life and live for God and live for their family. He's given us that responsibility. We need to take good care of children and bring the blessings of Christ to them. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for children. Thank you for mine and my grandkids. Uh, <clears throat> I pray, Father, that uh, uh, that you would give us the wisdom and the capacity and the way and the avenue to take good care of children. Bless them so that they can come to know Jesus in a powerful and personal way. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.